Among the hottest topics in South Africa right now, land reform, land restitution. They're the buzzword since the advent of democracy in South Africa. But implementation has left many people quite disgruntled. Farmers, landowners, players in the sector are on edge as we try to negotiate what the future of agriculture should look like in South Africa. This is The Money Makers. I'm Bruce Whitfield. Tonight, I am joined by Peter Setu, who is the chief executive of Vumelana Advisory Fund, a non-profit organization that helps communities in the land reform program to develop their land. We recently, Peter, had this, uh, the, the whole big Nampu festival, and it's where farmers, short pants, two-tone shirts, big tractors, um, come together to celebrate everything that is agriculture. But more and more what we're seeing at places like Nampu is the very difficult con conversation about land restitution. And it's one that should be a lot more advanced than it is. Yeah, no, abs absolutely. I mean, land restitution and, and land reform broadly is a constitutional imperative. Mm. It's something that, that it's not a nice thing to do. It's, it's something that we have to do in this country. And yes, we've got challenges, but I believe there are, I mean, events such as NAMPO and what, what transpired then, the debates that took place at NAMPO really demonstrate to me that uh, there are a number of industry players out there who really wants to make a difference in this space. And one is increasingly seeing that government is also really lending an eye to the industry to find creative ways through which they could collaborate. I mean, it was so interesting just looking at the agriculture minister who was at Nampo, who was talking about commercial farming and the importance of commercial farming and food security as being the backbone of any agricultural solution in the country. And then when some other politicians, the president in particular, gets his back against the wall, he starts throwing the constitution out the window and saying, land restitution without compensation. We see that sort of populist call come by we need to see the constitution amended um, uh, is there a real willingness for land reform or is this just being used as a political football to manipulate South Africa well uh, uh, as Vumelani obviously our starting point is to really come up with some practical solutions to land reform essentially having realized that uh, a number of uh, communities out there who got their land as part of a uh, land restitution ended up having these pieces of land and not having the skills, not the yeah. requisite resources to actually work their land. Because what you guys do is you go into a farming operation, it's all well and good to be given a thousand hectares of land, maybe some seeds, a tractor and a cow. Um, but at some point, you've had one or two bad years of drought, you don't have the, the, the commercial skills necessarily to, to, to do modern large-scale agriculture. And a lot of people have floundered. And a lot of people, unfortunately, through no fault of their own, have failed. The state has effectively let yeah. them down by setting them up to fail. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when we started in 2012, those are certainly one, some of the areas that we wanted to, to focus on, i.e. to try and bring together the private sector into this space so that they can assist communities in developing their land. But one of the things that, we've, that we are increasingly experiencing is that perhaps we need to have interventions Pre, at a stage before people can actually get their land. Because at the point when you intervene, when people have already uh, received their land, chances are that a lot of people have already lost their, their, well, the, the their, pressure their jobs, is on. The, the, the moment you know? The moment you get the land and the moment you move on to the land and start working the land, it's game on. Absolutely. Um, there are no second chances in this. Absolutely. That's why increasingly we are saying and we are getting to a point where we believe that we need to intervene even before land can be transferred. I firstly identify what are the community needs, what is it that, that needs to be done, ensuring that we can retain those jobs that have been created already and find ways through which we can create even more jobs. You know. I mean, do you see agriculture still as a big jobs creator? I mean, I just look at the, the mechanization of agriculture and the commercialization of agriculture now and how farmers are buying 8 million rand tractors because they can pull discs and planters that are 16 rows wide. That requires a lot less people, um, more highly skilled, but fewer people to do jobs that perhaps would have been done by three or four people 20 years ago. Well, uh, mechanization in this industry is, is a reality. Yeah. However, agriculture still remains one of the potentially big job creators in this uh, in this country however it is important to note that uh, to reflect that a lot of times when you talk about land reform there's 
a tendency to rather focus more on agriculture and losing sight of the fact that a, a substantial number of farms that have been restituted to communities lend itself to to ecotourism, sure, you know, which is also a, a, a big spinner in terms of uh, job creation, etc. And as Vumelana, I mean, from the projects that we've that we've supported thus far, we've not, noticed that uh, uh, ecotourism also can give me one mean, example of a success story in that ecotourism space. Well, we an example we have supported one one of the projects that we've supported is in the Barakolohadi community, a communal property association which is located in the northwest. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a community, a very one of the very poor communities. They got about twenty six thousand uh, uh, hectares of land. They did not have the means, the technical skills, and the technical know how to actually work this land. So our starting point was to assist them with the investment mobilization. Because as you can imagine, because ecotourism projects are by their own very nature very capital intensive, you need to get the investors who've got the skills, who've got the technical know-how, and most importantly, who are willing to assume, yeah. to assume that risk. You know. So what we did was to actually mobilize investment in excess of 100 million rents to actually work the land. I mean, the project is now at implementation stage. We're already seeing, even before brick and mortar can be put, we're already seeing communities starting to benefit through some of the jobs that have been created, etc. Those are great success stories, and there are lots of them. But government Absolutely. is sitting on 4,000 farms that are ripe and ready for, for distribution, but it's not doing it. Um, that's a problem. Um, and there's also there's this, this massive expectation of the, the democracy dividend, which hasn't come through in financial terms. People have got the vote, but the land is still predominantly in white hands. And that very, very thorny political issue has to be sorted out. And there are a couple of scenarios which you've painted. You talk about uh, connection and capture, where land is used as, as a tool um, in sort of in the power stakes of South Africa. You talk about market power and concentration. Land is a productive asset, and that's where a lot of commercial farmers sit, and they say, well, you know, you can't divide this farm up because then people will go hungry. You've got occupation and confiscation, the Zimbabwe um, alternative, or possibly the most palatable, the toughest way of doing it, and that's through hard negotiation, hard discussion, and paying a fair price for a great asset, and empowering people to ensure that those become remain productive assets into the future. Absolutely. I mean, when, when the scenarios is really part of Vumelani's contribution to the national discourse to say these are the possible scenarios. This is what could happen. We are not saying this is what will happen. This is what could happen. Yeah. But I mean, increasingly, we are finding it that as and when we present these scenarios to various parties, a lot of people are actually saying, look, the way to go is actually the hard bargaining and, and, and compromise. But I mean, in reality, we are seeing at some point, each of these scenarios really playing themselves out, 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 out there, you know. Yes, land, land reform, as we've said, is, is a constitutional imperative. And we are saying the most immediate way of addressing that, this anxiety that you've just correctly referred to is to actually to get the private sector to, to play into this space. You know? And this is, this is the role that we are playing as Vumelan. And we are hoping that as and when we actually support some of these projects, it can have a demonstrative effect. You know, and it can be scalable because the kind of projects where we intervene, we are saying we want to do it in such a manner that it can demonstrate that this is one of the ways through which we can have sustainable land reform in this country. Is the Department of Agriculture treating you seriously? Are they looking at your case studies and, and, and engaging you on that basis? Well, we work very closely with government. We do have a memorandum of understanding with the Department of uh, Rural Development and right. Land Reform, which is the custodian. Of the land, of, of, yeah, exactly, yeah. which is the custodian of, of, of land reform, you know. We have a very good working relationship with them. Are they doing their job adequately enough? I mean, that's a, a tough question for you <laughs> when you've got this memorandum of understanding. But my understanding is there's a lot of desire to do the right thing, but they, they lack the capacity to, to be effective. Well, I, I have to, to say that land reform is a, is a, is a difficult arena to, to, to work in. I mean, there are lots of complications from intra-community infightings amongst the communities to the fact that uh, we, you've got this pie and uh, in the in the form of the government fiscus and you've got all these demands on the from education mm. to your social grants to your everything so if you like 
our observation, my observation certainly is that uh, whilst uh, progress has been made over the last couple of years, there is more that can still be done to actually make sure that... How, how land much time have we more. got to, to get a fairer system in place than has existed for the last 350 years? Well, the reality is that uh, land reform has actually been slower. Probably um, uh, the expectations amongst the South Africans was that... Uh, this was supposed to be expedited. By the 28th of April, 1994, farms would be handed over. Absolutely. Yes. But the reality of the situation is uh, that's, not, that's not how things happened. You know? um, so, so, yes, there is that anxiety. Uh, and, 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 and the fact of the matter is all role players and stakeholders need to really take off their heads, policy positions, and actually you know, sit under one room and actually decide what is it that we need to do in order to make land reform work because as you've rightly pointed out we don't have time people no. are actually anxious so that is the space that we are trying to play in as Fumela to say we want to continue to support land reform projects so that it can have a demonstrative effect so that we can create demonstrate that we can create much needed jobs yeah. demonstrate that we can assist communities to create markets because it's one thing to to capitalize some of these projects but it's something that because our people I mean, when they lost the land, they lost access to virtually everything, yeah. including access to the market. Well, uh, so these are some land of the is capital, are, land is money, land absolutely. is a uh, stake in the future, land is absolutely pivotal to everything. Peter Setu, who is the chief executive of Umalani Advisory Fund, more issues, more controversial issues, more difficult issues, more important issues to discuss on Future Money Makers. Till then, have a very good evening. Good night. The third Discovery Financial Planning Summit is taking place on the 29th of May 2017. It features some of the world's industry-leading keynote speakers in the field of financial planning. The summit will address key trends facing advisors in 2017 and beyond. Financial planners have a more pivotal role than ever to play. This full-day event offers you the opportunity to care how to embrace technology and more effectively connect with your clients, gain insights into global investment strategies and get a better outlook on markets. Please go to www.